Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today's topic uh, is a person who is sometimes called the 19th century Rosa Parks. The comparison is somewhat apt, as you'll see as her story unfolds. But while Elizabeth Jennings Graham was raised by parents who were active in advocating for better quality of life and for people of color, uh, her involvement and how this thing played out, one, was a a little bit accidental. uh, So it wasn't something that was part of a bigger civil rights movement necessarily. Uh, It just kind of happened. The other thing that's interesting and that makes them very different is that while the story of Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott and the part she played in it became very much a part of history that remains talked about, for a long time, Elizabeth Jennings Graham kind of fell off the radar and people lost the thread of her part of history and her uh, work for improvement of the quality of life of Black people in 19th century New York. Yeah, it's way earlier than the Montgomery bus boycott and also not in the South. <laughs> yeah, it is a hundred years earlier. It's like a, um, so the Montgomery bus boycott happened in uh, 1955. This incident, initial incident that that catalyzed this whole thing started in 1854. Parts of it continued into 1855. So almost exactly a hundred years fascinating story. And again, it kind of got lost for a while, but some historians have really picked up the the flag and kind of done some research and really investigated who this person was. And there's also a fun little tag at the end of this about how kids are starting to learn more and more about her story. So the date of Elizabeth Jennings Graham's birth is completely unknown. We don't have any idea what the month or the date of her birth was. Her death certificate lists 1826 as the year of her birth, but a census that was conducted in 1850 lists it as 1830. Uh, We'll talk a little bit later about something that gives a clue about which of those might be more correct, but we still don't know what would have caused that discrepancy in the first place. And Elizabeth's father, Thomas Jennings, was the first Black man to hold a U.S. patent, which he was awarded in the early 1820s. He had begun his professional life in tailoring, and he had invented a means to clean clothes using solvents. It was an early version of dry cleaning. I have read in some places it was called dry scouring, but we don't actually have the text of the patent. He and Elizabeth's mother, who was also named Elizabeth, were part of New York's Black middle class. They lived at 167 Church Street in Lower Manhattan, and they were active in the community, working on improving the lives of other Black citizens. Slavery had been abolished in New York during Thomas's lifetime over the course of a series of laws between 1799 and 1827. These phased out the institution of slavery in New York incrementally, and he had used his patent money to purchase the freedom of some of his family members. Yeah, he had been born free, but not everyone in his family had been. And Thomas had long been involved in activism against racial injustice. He attended the first three national conventions of free people of color, which began in 1830. And he helped found the Wilberforce Philanthropic Society, which helped Black citizens improve their lives. Thomas and his wife, Elizabeth, had at least four other children, in addition to their daughter, Elizabeth. There were two boys and two girls we know about named William, Thomas Jr., Matilda, and Lucy. The children all attended school. This was a time when education wasn't a given for children of any background. Public schools were established in New York in the early 1800s, but there weren't any kind of requirements to attend school, and a lot of children were working at jobs at a very early age. The Jennings children were a lot more educated than many other children in New York. And from a young age, Elizabeth followed in her family's ideology of fighting against racial injustice. At the age of 10, she recited an essay at a gathering of the Ladies' Literary Society of the City of New York entitled On the Improvement of the Mind, which was later published in the paper The Colored American. That paper was published in 1837, so if she was 10 at the time, this supports that 1826 year of birth a little bit more than we have anything to support the 1830 year. Although Elizabeth Jennings was born a free woman, she was also still a Black woman, and she grew up in a largely de facto segregated New York. 
Slavery was not abolished at the, fe- at the federal level at the time of the primary event that we're talking about today. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was still in effect. That act required that enslaved people who ran away to non-slave states be captured and returned to their owners. Aiding someone who escaped enslavement was also illegal. Free Black men and women in states that had abolished slavery feared that they could be kidnapped and transported to a slave state even though they had not been enslaved. Yeah, that was a very real concern um, because they would have no way to fight that. If someone dragged them into a slave state and sold them, they have no recourse against it at that point. It was a really dangerous time. Yeah, we've we've talked about it in episodes before and talked about people even the taking the step of, if they had the means, moving to Canada yep. to get away from the risk of being sold into slavery in the United States. There also were not a lot of job prospects for a young person of color to aspire to, even in New York. Ministry and teaching jobs were some of the few non-labor positions that were available to Black citizens. And those positions were finite. They could only minister or teach other people of color. But the Jennings children really seemed to do quite well for themselves. William ended up becoming a businessman. I believe he moved to Boston. Thomas Jr. was a dentist. Uh, He moved to New Orleans, I think. And Matilda was a dressmaker. Elizabeth became a teacher. Uh, I read one thing where in 1855, she was one of only 13 Black teachers in New York. Uh, And after a year of teaching at Colored Public School Number 2, she worked in the system that was established by the New York Society for the Promotion of Education Among Colored Children, uh, which was a better school system for her. And she also worked as a church organist. On July 16th, 1854, Jennings was traveling to the First Colored American Congregational Church, preparing to accompany the afternoon choir practice. As usual, she walked a short distance from the Jennings home to a streetcar stop at the corner of Pearl and Chatham. She ran into her friend, Sarah E. Adams, as she walked, and the two of them walked together to the stop. She tried to board a horse-drawn streetcar, which was run by the Third Avenue Railway Company. Horse-drawn streetcars normally had two men who were running them. There was the driver and the conductor. And the streetcar company had a policy against allowing Black passengers. This was a common policy on streetcars. Often, Black people who wanted to take a streetcar would have to wait for one with a sign that indicated that people of color were allowed to board. But those were not as frequent as cars that only accepted white passengers. The problem of the transportation system and its treatment of Black people was not new. In a rapidly growing city like New York, streetcars were increasingly relied upon by the city's inhabitants, and activists had been writing about the poor treatment of Black travelers for more than two decades before this point. And we're going to pause a little bit early for our sponsor break here because I want to keep the account of what actually happened once the streetcar came all together. So we're going to jump right back in after we first have this pause. Elizabeth was a little bit worried about making it to the church to accompany the choir on time, so she took a chance. Sometimes a conductor would allow a Black passenger to board if none of the other passengers objected. And so when Elizabeth explained her predicament to the conductor, he was not sympathetic. He told her she could just wait for the next car. And she wrote about this incident, quote, he told me that the other car had my people in it, that it was appropriated for that purpose. I then told him I had no people. It was no particular occasion. I wished to go to church as I had been doing for the last six months, and I did not wish to be detained. So even though the conductor had told her to get off the streetcar, Elizabeth stayed on. She said she would take the next one if it was one that would take Black passengers, but she was going to stay on the current one until it got there. When the second streetcar came, it was full, which was another problem that arose from the scarcity of cars that allowed Black passengers. And this set up a battle of wills. Both Elizabeth and the conductor of the car she was standing on were willing to stand their ground and wait for the other one to give in. Eventually, though, it was the driver's desire to get going that led the conductor to yield. Elizabeth was no shrinking violet, and even as she was allowed to board, she told the conductor that she didn't know where he was born, but that she was a New Yorker and that she had never been treated so poorly while attempting to go to church and that he was an impudent fellow. 
The conductor answered that he was from Ireland, and she replied that she didn't care where he was from. She only cared that, quote, he behaved himself and did not insult genteel persons. This set the conductor off. He physically removed Elizabeth's friend Sarah and then dragged Elizabeth herself out. She attempted to resist by holding onto the window sash, and after a bit of a struggle, the conductor told the driver to come out and help him. The two men took Jennings by the arms and removed her from the car, dragging her down to the platform. She was screaming, and her friend was shouting, you'll kill her, don't kill her. And after she had been dumped onto the platform, the driver went back to his horses. And in an incredibly bold move, before the streetcar could leave, Elizabeth got up and she marched right back onto the streetcar and she sat in a seat. The conductor was irate and he ordered the driver to take off and to drive as quickly as he could until they found either a police officer or a police station. When the driver spotted a policeman, he stopped the car. The conductor spoke with the officer and after the conductor told his side of the story... Jennings, who was not asked to give her version of the story, was removed. The conductor wrote his name and the streetcar number on a slip of paper and handed it to her, and the streetcar left. Yeah, incidentally, he wrote the wrong number for the streetcar on that slip of paper. It's unknown whether he was trying to hide something or if he just was incorrect, but just one of the many, uh, many problems of that day. So Elizabeth at this point, I mean, she had literally been thrown on the ground. She was kind of a mess. She was normally a very put together, uh, really, you know, lovely young woman. And so she headed home on foot. A bookseller from Germany had actually uh, approached her and he said that he had seen the entire incident, that he would be happy to serve as a witness, and he gave her his information. When she got home, her disheveled appearance really frightened her parents. They had a doctor come and examine her. He put her on bed rest and mentioned that she might have broken bones. Uh, Yeah, she had a bit of a limp by the time she got home. And Elizabeth wrote out everything that had happened at her father's urging. So while she rested at home, her father took that letter that she had written to leaders of the Black community throughout Lower Manhattan, and that included Frederick Douglass. A meeting was called at the First Colored American Congregational Church, quote, for the purpose of making an expression of public sentiment condemnatory of the outrage committed upon the person of Miss Elizabeth Jennings, a highly respectable female. Elizabeth couldn't attend due to her doctor-imposed bed rest, so her father went in her place and read aloud her account of events on the, the events on the streetcar a five-person committee was formed to examine the facts of the incident and to decide on what the next step should be. They took a collection to help cover the costs of an attorney. Elizabeth's account was also sent to the paper, and on July 19th of 1854, that story was printed in the New York Daily Tribune. So while the Tribune was a New York paper, it had weekly editions that were mailed to subscribers throughout the country. Thomas Jennings was on this five-man investigative committee, He and his colleagues decided to fight the streetcar company for their treatment of his daughter. They hired attorney Chester A. Arthur, although he wasn't their first choice. Their first choice had been abolitionist Erastus D. Culver. But when they met with him, he referred them to Arthur, who had only been practicing law for six weeks. Because Culver had been elected to a judgeship in Brooklyn, he had given the young Chester A. Arthur all of his cases— But Arthur, who was 24 at the time, would later go on to become the 21st president of the United States, and he was a strong ally. He had been Culver's apprentice, and he was ideologically aligned with his mentor. And Arthur filed a suit on behalf of Elizabeth Jennings in the New York State Supreme Court, seeking damages from the conductor, the driver, and the Third Avenue Railway Company. But this was not just about getting recompense for Elizabeth. The hope was that this lawsuit, which was filed as a civil case rather than a criminal case, would change the company's stance on segregated streetcars if the Third Avenue Railway Company lost. Thomas Jennings wrote of the case, quote, The assault, though a very aggravated case, is only secondary in our view to the rights of our people. He also made the point that it was mere custom that kept Black people on segregated streetcars. There was no actual law that said that people of any color couldn't sit on any streetcar they wished. That's one of the big, uh, not not continual, but but frequently 
differences between segregation in the North and the South is that a lot of times in the South, there were laws specifically saying all these things. And in the North, it was more common that these were sort of socially enforced, but not actually documented anywhere. At a literary exhibition held at the First Colored American Congregational Church in the fall of that year, Elizabeth played the organ, and as part of the programming, speeches were given in support of overthrowing slavery and and bettering the lives of Black people. Events like this continued to garner support for her case in the community while they waited for a court date. Yeah, and as this news was spreading throughout the country, she was receiving letters of support uh, from around the United States. And the case of Elizabeth Jennings versus Third Avenue Railway Company went to trial the following year, on February 22, 1855. The case was filed and tried in Brooklyn rather than Manhattan because the company was headquartered there. And that courtroom was packed. The records of the court proceedings are unfortunately lost. Uh, It is believed that the German bookseller that we mentioned earlier, Elizabeth's friend Sarah, Thomas Jennings, and Elizabeth herself were all witnesses. They all testified, of course, before a jury that consisted entirely of white men. After the testimony, Judge William Rockwell's instructions to the jury made it clear that a company was legally responsible for the actions of its employees. He also stated that as a public transportation business, the Third Avenue Railway Company was, quote, bound to carry all respectable persons, that colored persons, if sober, well-behaved, and free from disease, had the same rights as others. Those instructions made news and they were printed in the papers after the trial. And while they do represent an important moment, which was a state Supreme Court judge saying that people of color had the same rights as others, there are also a lot of qualifiers on those rights, basically saying that to be entitled to those same rights, they had to be the right kind of Black people. Yeah. Uh, But after deliberation, the jury returned to the courtroom, and the lead juror handed the judge in the case their decision. And the paper read, quote, The jury has awarded Miss Jennings $225 plus 10% for court costs. So they had won. This was less than half of the amount that they had filed for, which was $500. But it was also what Elizabeth made in a full year at her job. And it was greeted as a huge win, not just for the Jennings, but for New York's Black community. We'll talk about what happened after the trial, after we take a break for a word from a sponsor. Frederick Douglass's paper, which was actually the name uh, that he had changed the North Star to, it was literally called Frederick Douglass's paper. Uh, he made that change in 1851, ran the story of Jennings' successful court case with the headline, Legal Rights Vindicated, and opening with, quote, our readers will rejoice with us in the righteous verdict given. Other papers across the country also picked up the story, including Judge Rockwell's words. The Pacific Appeal, which is a paper published in San Francisco, ran the story with the headline, quote, A Wholesome Verdict. The final paragraph takes the tone of the write-up in an interesting direction. It hints that the writer was more concerned with people bringing their stinky groceries onto streetcars than whether a passenger is Black. It reads, quote, Railroads, steamboats, omnibuses, and ferryboats will be admonished from this as to the rights of respectable colored people. It is high time that the rights of this class of citizens were ascertained and that it should be known whether they are to be thrust from our public conveyances while women with a quarter of mutton or a load of codfish can be admitted. (laughs) That kind of cracked me up. Uh, That headline, A Wholesome Verdict, and the basic story ran in a bunch of different papers. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if you'll see an AP story repeated throughout multiple papers today, very similarly, the same story ran word for word in a lot of places. But soon after this case was settled, the Third Avenue Railroad Company did start integrating its streetcars, and other companies followed suit. But for clarity, it was not as though they had seen the light and believed that this was the right thing to do. This was a business decision. They were really fearful that more lawsuits could follow and that they would start hemorrhaging money if more juries made similar decisions. There were a handful of similar cases over the next two years. While companies were integrating their streetcars, it wasn't as though conductors all stopped being racist due to those changes. After the ruling, Thomas Jennings founded the Legal Rights Association. This organization is sometimes called a precursor to the NAACP, and it was an advocacy group that helped Black New Yorkers find and pay for legal representation in civil rights cases. 
It also lobbied for fair treatment of people of color. It organized protests and educated the public. Thomas Jennings died four years after Elizabeth's court case in 1859. Yeah, unfortunately, he did not live long enough to see uh, some of the many things that he had fought so hard for. In 1860, Elizabeth met and married a man named Charles Graham, who was from St. Croix. Elizabeth and Charles had a son in 1862, named in honor of Elizabeth's father, Thomas. But unfortunately, Thomas died in infancy, just a year after his birth. Uh, the only thing that I have found that seems to ever be written up as the cause of his death is convulsions. Uh, so we don't know the exact nature of his illness. Charles and Elizabeth actually traveled with Thomas's body from Manhattan to its burial place in Brooklyn. And that was actually a trip that was very, very dangerous at this time because the Civil War draft riots were taking place in the city. The Grahams, along with Elizabeth's mother, left the city after that and they moved to New Jersey. Charles Graham died in 1867. He was only 34, and he and Elizabeth had only been married for seven years. Elizabeth and her mother continued to live together in the Eatontown area for the next several years. In 1871, the Jennings women moved back to Lower Manhattan, this time into a home at 543 Broom Street. In 1873, Elizabeth's mother died. And Elizabeth had continued to work as a teacher throughout her life, but after losing her child, her husband, and her mother in the course of a decade, teaching children became pretty much the entire focus of her life. Elizabeth Jennings Graham moved once more after her mother's death, this time to a house at 237 West 41st Street, which was closer to the school where she worked. In 1881, Chester A. Arthur became president when President James A. Garfield was assassinated. And his rise to the highest office in U.S. government kicked up a bit of interest in the 1855 court case again, but Elizabeth did not seem particularly interested in stepping into the spotlight. In 1895, her home on West 41st Street became the site of the first free kindergarten for Black children in New York. She also continued to live there, but she lived on the upper floor and had the school downstairs. And she was not alone in setting up this kindergarten. She worked with two other women, Mrs. James Herbert Morse and Mrs. Edward Curtis. And the idea of kindergarten, which was really more supervised play than, you know, book learning, so to speak, was still relatively new. Uh, It had been developed in the 1830s in Germany, but even 60 years later, though private and then public kindergartens had been established in some cities in the U.S., there still were not any in New York for Black children prior to this. I wish we knew her colleagues' names beyond their husbands' names. I do, too. That happens sometimes when we're researching this far back in the past. So this was not a situation where it was like a daycare running out of Elizabeth's home. The school had a structure. It was funded through donors, and a teacher named Leonie G. Rickard was hired to manage the curriculum. The lower level of the home was made into a schoolroom, and the yard was transformed into an outdoor activity area, Elizabeth Jennings Graham also ran a lending library out of the house. She was also the librarian. And on Saturdays, the classroom was used as a sewing school. I love how busy she was (laughs) with all of these endeavors. Well, and she really was kind of carrying on her father's legacy of like trying to help people help themselves by becoming more educated and more skilled and more knowledgeable. And it's a, that family has some pretty good, um, pretty good values. So Elizabeth died in her sleep on June 5th, 1901 in her home. So that was six years after she started the school. Uh, She worked literally right up until the day she died. She was in her 70s at the time. She was buried in Cypress Hills Cemetery in Brooklyn. In 2007, a small street marker appeared on the corner of Park Row and Spruce Street that read Elizabeth Jennings Place. It's not the exact intersection where she was assaulted, but it is nearby that spot. And in a fitting full circle moment for somebody who dedicated her professional career to teaching, it is the work of school children. Third and fourth grade students from New York's PS361 had been studying Elizabeth Jennings Graham, and they got the idea to try to have her commemorated. 
And this was not the first time this happened. There was a previous class that attempted something similar but was not successful. But the kids collected signatures from area residents, and then with the help of their teachers, they put together their case to petition the city. And after trying to have first a playground named for her, which did not pan out, um, and then selecting the intersection where she had boarded that streetcar but finding it had already been given an honorary designation, that alternate corner was chosen by city officials, but it was approved by the students and their teachers. So she does have small little recognition, a little sign that you will see if you are at the corner of um, Park Row and Spruce, because some of those streets have also changed names from when she was there. Do you also have some listener mail for us? I do. It's really exciting listener mail to me. It is from our listener, John. It is a lot of information about Carmen Miranda. Um, I'm going to... edit this a little bit because otherwise it will be a very long listener mail segment because he has so much info. You will find out why, Um, but I will try to include the best parts. Hi, thank you for your show on Carmen Miranda. I am the writer, director, producer of the documentary Carmen Miranda, That Girl from Rio for 20th Century Fox. Uh, He had not read one of the bios that I read, but he's putting it on his list. And he said, while you're unlikely to watch the documentary, it does cover some areas that you seemed a little less certain about in your podcast. Uh, He also gives a link to it up on YouTube, which we can share in the show notes. And he said some important aspects. Carmen Miranda was a comic songstress in Brazil. She sang at high-end clubs in the south of the country, and her very first performances of her signature song uh, in the country played on a caricature of the fruit sellers. And it was in a film in which she appeared in Brazil, and in it, she is wearing an absurd version of the actual cultural dress. And it bothered no one in Brazil at the time because, of course, it was played for comedy. Uh, He gives us the lyrics. I'm not going to read them out because that will take a while. But this song, he says, played on lots of cultural stereotypes that existed in Brazil, and it played very well to the European descendant population. While she did not sing in blackface, there was an element within Brazilian culture that could relate this to Al Jolson singing Mammy, which Jolson and the majority of Americans at the time saw as a celebration of black culture and not offensive. He goes on some more. The other thing that I wanted to... um, mentioned from his his very thorough email uh, was about that question that we had about that photograph <laughs> that was taken. Oh, yeah. Which was unflattering where she was not wearing any underwear and it became very scandalous. And he writes, the photo of Miranda was taken by the Fox Studio photographer. It was not taken by an outside photographer. It was posted on a bulletin board on the lot the next day. I believe the man who printed the photo was fired, but he had made copies and he took them off the lot. At the time, photos like that could not be sold or published openly, but there was a huge market distributing pornographic images to soldiers. Most moviegoers inside the U.S. never saw the picture. Uh, That is very, very cool. Uh, John, thank you so much. I watched the first part of the movie. I haven't gotten to watch the whole thing yet just because I have had lack of time. But uh, the opening alone delights me because it features a really beautiful pink and white costume. Uh, (laughs) um, And so, like I said, we will share that link if people want to watch it. John, thank you so much for your email. That was fabulous. I'm glad you cleared up that photo question for us. Uh, If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. You can also find us across the spectrum of social media as Missed in History. And we are at MissedInHistory.com, which is our little corner of the web where we have every episode of the podcast that has ever existed, including those before Tracy and I were ever a part of it. And you'll also find show notes and things like our sources for the ones that Tracy and I have worked on. So we encourage you, come and play with us at MissedInHistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 